hold a meeting to order at five thirty four in the evening. Um, first item on our agenda is public comment. Open it up to any members of the public who have something to add to our meeting, which is not on the agenda. Seeing no public comment, I'll entertain a hey, motion. Uh, Larry, this is Sonny Holt. Uh, hey, Sonny. Yeah, I, I sent uh, Trini uh, a letter I got from uh, someone that wants to join the um, Planning Commission. I don't know if that's been disseminated to the uh, select board or not. Yeah. Yes, um, we, we have that, and and we have a, an appointment section of our agenda existing, so we're just going to add it to that. Okay, super. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, approval of the agenda? Move to approve. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Consent calendar? I'll move to approve the assent cal uh, consent calendar. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Passes. Move on to our first item of business, which is the jetter for the yeah. So sewer, Chris, sewer folks. Chris Chambers is here with us too. I'm going to do a little share screen so we can maybe put up what was on. Um, oops, that's the wrong one. Sorry. Trip to the yellow there. Um, not, uh, yeah, I'm still. Should be open, right? Hey, anyway, Chris, if you wanted to start start talking, will I figure out what I'm doing wrong here? Um, so we had talked about at the last select board meeting, we informed the board that um, our jetter was kind of on its way out. Um, we've assembled four quotes from four different companies. Um, I don't have the sheet in front of me, um, but they range from... Oh, there it is. Uh, high nineties nice. to about one hundred and twenty. Um, we had a series of things in talking with the different companies and different options that would help us with various jobs and also avoid having to hire certain contractors for certain things. Um, and labeled those out, and then this. Uh, the one from Hot Jet USA was kind of hit all the main points. But one of the biggest things is their turnaround time right now. Um, all these companies use kind of the same idea of a pump. And they're, they have two or they had two on the shelf mm -hmm. when uh, we formulated the spreadsheet. Uh, I do not know if they still have one on the shelf or not. Um, but that was the reason why they could do such a quick turnaround time. If both of those pumps are sold, their turnaround time falls in with everyone else's. Um, but they had the the heat set up, um, the antifreeze system, which was standard on theirs. It wasn't extra money, uh, and just a whole array of different stuff that would help the arrow board, which is a safety feature to help kind of guide traffic. Wow. Chris, can you just explain briefly what a jetter is? I think I may have been, not been at the meeting when you might have spoken to this. Um, so yeah, uh, we use it to clear the line to get the lines flowing again. Okay. Um, we also use it for maintenance to keep the lines clean. Uh, we have various trouble lines that have either low flow or sags and to avoid backups in the basements and whatnot, we clean them out regularly, mm -hmm. um, with the jetter mm -hmm. right now, we're not do doing too much of that because the pump on our jetter blew a seal, which means that it's kind of riding on something and it pumps a bunch of water out and we're just trying to nurse it until we can 
get on the other end of this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Would this be used to clean out culverts? Could, could be, right, Chris? The heat and the, the jitter. We've used it before for culverts and could deploy yes. it. That way. Yes, that is correct. Um, that was one of the big advantages to the heat last winter, both the highway and us. We had some sewer lines, shallow sewer lines that froze, and the highway had a couple of frozen culverts. Um, we were able to get through them with the cold water, but the heat, if you had hot water to hit it with, it would clean both out much, much faster rather than a couple hours. It'd probably be done 20 minutes to a half hour. And Chris, on, the, on the, the, the first two models that are listed there, there's one says for hot water, it says yes, 146 degrees Fahrenheit. The other one says yes, plus 22. Does that mean it just it just has the capability to add 22 degrees to whatever the, the water temperature is coming out of where we're so, so we could not get the so the hot jet one they are confirming that theirs will add 22 degrees at the 40 gallons per minute at 2000 psi the others would not could not confirm or deny that spec on their end that was kind of a big thing um and actually hot jet with that final price actually added a second burner so actually in reality they can get 44 degrees um but they um the single burner is the 22 degrees now we also have the option to return it at a lower psi into the tank so we can heat the tank up uh relatively quickly but yes what you're saying larry is correct it, heats it up 20 so if the water's at 70 degrees it heats it up to 92 degrees on the first pass at the 40 gallons per minute flow rate but but you're saying that the actual one that that we get would actually be plus 44 at that same price correct and and this one the hot jet has a turning turret and the american jetter does not how important is that to you so for right now, we do not have a turning turret. Um, when you try to flush a line to properly flush a line and pull it, it's nice to have the reel feed in the proper way. It gives it your hydraulics the best strength. Also, you don't have, you can park with traffic rather than opposite traffic or having to try to run a line on a lateral away from it. Um, just to give an example, at the town office, there's a main line that crosses across the municipal parking lot from Summer Street. In order to flush that line, we actually got to go at a 90 degree angle, basically, and it's not ideal with our current setup. A rotating turret, it comes off and it allows you to get the proper angle and properly flush the line. Oh. Okay, so you're saying if you don't have the turning capability, you actually need to park the machine in the right direction, um, so it, so it'll it'll go and go where you want it. Right to get the proper hydraulic pressure out of pulling and running the hose. Yes. Okay. Chris, what does the antifreeze system do? So what it does is a allows us to put RV antifreeze into it. So when we're done with it, we can run the antifreeze through the hoses and stuff like that. So if we're transporting it in the middle of the night, say in January, February, when it's 20 below, stuff won't freeze up. Um, right now we typically fire it up and try to return it, but we also do our best not to have the jetter outside for very long in the middle of the winter like that. Just so components don't freeze up because some of the orifices are very small lines. And so by running the antifreeze, it avoids that problem. Okay. Anything else we should know? Um, I think all things considered looking at this, um, with this graphic that, that Chris has provided that uh, clearly looks like the hot jet is the most economical and efficient um, option for us, given all the specs here. 
It, much like we had to do with the loader and the roller recently um, in terms of available funds in the various reserves, the idea would be to try to lease finance this so it's a lease to own, same kind of five year time period to match what's statutorily allowed. And there are some third party vendors that or other partners that the equipment manufacturers work with. There's also a, a lease to own uh, outfit headquartered in Grand Isle um, that a lot of towns, cities have done business with over here. So we'd look for whatever sort of the best rate combination was there. It's a little different than the loader where Caterpillar and Deer and those types have sort of these well-established lease programs kind of mm -hmm. in house. Mm -hmm. This one would be either a third party or somebody like municipal lease consulting. Um, so we'll, we'll try to figure out which one's offers kind of the- Chris or Trevor, what's the expected life expectancy of, of, of a jetter? So um, um, our current one was built in 99 or it was built in 99. The town received it in 2000 um, and it's still alive. The biggest issue is, is a lot of the components are outdated to the point where they're not able to be repaired yeah. or replaced. Yeah. Um, that right, it actually, right. you, you did remind me about one thing that I liked about that we liked about the hot jet versus the other three. So hot jet doesn't make their own trailer. They go and buy a utility trailer um, and put all the stuff on the trailer itself. So say in 10 to 15 years, the trailer itself is rotting out or a problem. Um, either we can hire hot jet to come out and do it or we can do it ourselves we'd be able to take the components off the trailer and bolt it onto mm. another trailer mm. rather than wow. buying a specific trailer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, all things considered, that sounds like the best option. If, if we're ready for a motion, I would, I would move that we authorize um, Chris and the staff to uh, pursue financing options on the hot jet USA uh, Jetter. Are we asking them to go forward with the purchase or just to come back with another presentation? If we could go, we still may need your authorization to accept the financing proposal, but this ah, would, okay. All right. Place, place the order in, work that piece out, and the timeline should be good. So we can maybe hold the pump. You know, if there's one on the shelves, keep that timeline, and then we'll do sort of an accelerated mini RFP basically to try to get an idea in terms of what's the kind of the best option, most cost effective for us. Um, okay. Add around quickly. So would you like me to amend my motion then to authorize us to uh, uh, look into the financing options with a view towards maybe approving something at the December meeting? Maybe approving the finance vehicle at the December meeting. Right, right. Okay. I'll make that I'll make that motion then that we authorize exploration of financing options um, uh, uh, contingent upon making a decision at the December meeting. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Chris, before you go, does does our current debtor have any, <clears throat> any value um, once we're done using it? Um, so we were thinking about if, right, you know, we weren't real sure what we're going to do with it, but we were thinking about maybe stripping it and trying to make like a utility trailer out of it, put some tools and parts and stuff into it. Um, and I mean, right now it still quote unquote works, but it's going to cost about 15 to 20,000 just to get someone up to attempt to fix, to rebuild the pump. And if they were to do that, there's no guarantee because they can't buy new pistons for it. So it's a whole, it's, they fixed it and maybe the seal holds and maybe it doesn't. So it has, it might have some trade in value to some of them, but I, we hadn't really explored that option too much as a lot of them are like it, it, it's current superseded model came out in 2005. And that that model um, uses kind of similar components to today, whereas they just completely outdated what's on ours. Okay. Thank you, Chris. 
Thanks, Chris. Thank you. All right, so we'll, we'll move on to um, <clears throat> the charging station uh, easement and agreement. So Mark is here, and I think Jerry's here, at least for this topic, To This goes back to, um, you looked at a, a variation of this proposal back late winter right around town meeting, where all of the infrastructure would have been in the town and not on South Pleasant. This is sort of what I think of as the original idea goes back where the charging stations are on private property and really what the town's being asked for at this point is would we host or allow for um, the various parties involved to, you know, through sort of an easement agreement to place a concrete pad with some of the ancillary equipment into that town on lot and I'll pull up the site plans um, and then turn it over maybe to Mark or Jerry want to do I'm going to put up the one that was listed as number one first and if you want the other one let me know I can switch between them so as I mentioned here's the sort of the town owned lot you can see I think the, the difference is going to be the two configurations with the parking sort of where the arrow is this is sort of a pull-in space in each case the I, I suggest if I can interject sure I think it just go straight to option two option straight to option two okay. option one is dead <laughs> that makes it easy then. So this is option two. You can see where it's moved a little bit with the parking the stations here. They're over here on the private property. Still the same place and layout for the electric pad and its um, accessories. It's four by twelve unit. It's technically in our lot. As you can see, it's well outside of any area of impact for the parking lot. Um, we we'll tie into the infrastructure right here. So really what it is, is um, showing this conceptually, seeing if there are any questions, um, and then pursuing whatever the right easement, we've been calling it an easement agreement. I mean, really it would be to sort of an allow, some sort of an agreement to allow that infrastructure to be there and sort of define the things we talked about back in that earlier meeting, such as liability for equipment, those types of pieces. Mark has worked with the Blink folks and others on sort of stripping down some of that language to make it hopefully reflect the simplicity of what we're being asked and, and really what we're offered. So, um, so, so, so just to be clear, the, 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 um, the charging units themselves are on a private property, but the, the essentially the, the uh, hardware that will be powering those are in the easement area. Is that accurate? On this four by 12 pad. Yeah. You have some yeah, of the, right, right, right. Hardware, yeah. <clears throat> yes, that is accurate. Hold, yeah. It'd be under underground, right? Kind of up through here to feed the stations. I'm guessing kind of almost looks like it's pretty straight right. line. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Another underground to the pole that's shown next to the building. And, and it looks like there's two level two chargers and two high speed chargers. Is that accurate? Yes. Right. Right. And um, I'm just curious. I, I'm an EV owner, so I, I kind of know the ropes of this a little bit. Um, uh, uh, who will be the, um, will, will it be ChargePoint or EV Go? Who will be the provider for um, these? Do, you, do, do we know that yet or? It'd be Blink Solar, right? They're, yeah. Oh, they're Blink, right. okay. Yeah, Blink right. is the provider, yes. Blink is Blink, okay. They're kind of a newcomer to the. Yeah, so you know, if, may I speak for a moment? Uh, Trevor? Sure, sure. So, so Blink uh, has, has worked with the state uh, over the past year, and they've, they've built quite an agreement where uh, they want to have 10, 10 stations in the state of Vermont. And they chose Randolph for one of those stations, of course, and this came before the board earlier this year. Mm -hmm. uh, what's significant about this one is it does have the level three, which is a, about a, a 25 minute charge to get up to that 80% mm. capacity, which is supposed to be pretty much like the sweet spot for a vehicle. Mm. And uh, so the, there were issues with the, uh, with the contract, the terms of the contract that was, um, it was very broad. And of course, like most contracts are, when you start, it was heavily weighted to blink and, uh, but they were extraordinarily open to redlining like the vast majority of that. Um, however, the original process was there was going to be more liability to the town, uh, which people just, it was just, the select board had, there was some resistance. The, in 
talking to Jerry um, and in, in an attempt to try to, uh, to, to make an impact uh, development in the community, uh, Jerry's worked with all of the condo association owners. And for the most part, uh, there's, there's, and Jerry, I'll let you speak to this. There's uh, agreement that this is a project that would be a win for everybody, including the town, including the, the mm -hmm. digital uh, ecosystem that we're building uh, in the community. And so, uh, and, and Blink, it's a good time for us to strike the deal uh, because the contract, uh, the terms of the contract with the state mean uh, have uh, this, the end of December as an end date for it. So in other words, they're very, uh, they're interested in, in negotiating and getting this done. So Jerry's done a tremendous amount of work negotiating. Uh, the site plan shows the, you know, the details. And this is, a, this is from an economic development standpoint, this is a, a really fantastic opportunity for us to, uh, to show the, the importance of the relationship between the private and the public sector to get a deal done. Mm -hmm. And so, Trevor, what are, we, what are we being asked to do to, to right now tonight? It, essentially, it's wanted to show you this um, sort of return in idea or revised idea, and then if folks are okay with it, we'll work over the next month or so to create that. I, I keep calling it a hosting agreement, for lack of a better, or an easement um, okay. on that piece, and bring that back for action in December, and it still fits those timelines. But as long as everybody's okay with the or the rough. Because we'll, it was we'll really, that. yeah, because it yeah. was really the, the the details of the contract which kind of made this not go right the last time. It wasn't so much the general like yeah, where is it going to happen physically? It yeah, was the legal part of it, right? It was the, the the thing that was just tripping us up. Yeah, the idea had the, had broad support in any sort of configuration. It was yeah, yeah. some of the logistical. Legal entanglements. Barbara, can, can you elaborate a little bit, or maybe Mark? On it says here in in the uh, board packet, um, an idea was considered to ask for the ability to charge any municipal fleet vehicles at the stations at no cost in exchange. Can, can you elaborate on that a little bit, and whether that's still part of the consideration? Yeah, that, that was part of some of the earlier drafting and some conversations we had internally. It was sort of that idea if we're, I mean, there's an inherent public good and Mark talked on some of the economic value in terms of from a travel and tourism element and also supporting yeah, digital yeah. ecosystem project. So the question was really, do we need to consider for something of this scale? Should there be some other public good, some direct public good? So the idea we had that was sort of low threshold was that one. It was a very much kind of a pie in the sky spitball. We mm -hmm. you know what we electrify parts of the fleet, if at all. And and really the more I think about it just from a practical, if we do, we're probably going to have that charging infrastructure at whatever that work site. Right. Is. Right. And so I don't I don't know that it's a viable thing. I don't know that we necessarily need to ask yeah. for anything. It was just one of those things in thinking back to that earlier conversation yeah. and the yeah. other ones. At least to touch the base of of do you need anything for playing host? And if it's really just you know partnership collaboration and the inherent benefits of it, and mm -hmm. that's that's more than enough, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jerry, you gonna say something? Um, yeah. So to your point, Larry, about what kind of the impediment was last time is it was partly what you said, but also I got the impression that. The town was kind of stuck on how to or whether they whether they need to offer to do an easement at all um, and or how to do that and what does it need a lawyer that need professional language and so if we can simplify it and just call it an agreement um, with our own language it's it seems like it's fine to me um, and as far as the easement goes it's kind of obscured in the site plan there, but if you look at where it's, where the tag is right in the middle of the big building that says proposed, what does it say? The purple tag, proposed EV electric pad, with, so the label. That's actually on top of the existing easement, which is somewhat, somewhat larger than the pad is, 
but smaller than the label is. Mm -hmm. So it's already, it's not intruding at all on any uses that the town could ever use with that property. No. In fact, I, I would say the easement to use that has already been granted. It's just that it's a new use. Because right. because there's something, what's there? There's already some sort of pad there? Yeah, there's, there's a bunch, there's, there's like 15 bollards and they're protecting an underground propane tank with a thousand gallons. Oh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's well, that is on the far side. So uh, that's that's partly on Trillium's property, and it's partly on town property. Uh, that's why there needed to be an so, easement originally. So, so the property line must be just a couple of feet from the building. Right? It is. It's ridiculous. <laughs> I think it's either eight or twelve feet. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, if the if if this pad's only four feet wide, then it's there's not space for it just to be on. The Trillium property then? It, it no, be, because it has to be, I think it's 10 feet from the building. Ah, uh, uh, no, I see. By yeah. some by some code to do with um, electric code or something. Electrical code, yeah. You know, looking at the picture, it looks like deliveries have or do come in through that area. Um, yeah, I think you've seen a trash truck there that was and you think of this path? Yeah, yeah, and and that truck there was a very convenient timing for a photo um <laughs> that, that is where deliveries do come occasionally and ideally would continue to come um, so that's 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 what we're going to try to preserve and, and not um it's well how would they continue to come there I um, because um, this drawing doesn't show it real well, but um, the trucks would be in. You see where the green dotted line is for the guardrail. Um, that that's actually when you drive up in the main way to get into the municipal parking lot. That would be on your left. So. so what looks like it's blocked off is just a big shadow of a tree there um, that the green line goes through. So it's an artifact of the photograph. And so, right, the trucks would just do what they're doing now, essentially. They would, they would be able to go up there. Um, and the, most of the deliveries are very short term anyway, like 10 minutes. And so it's not that intrusive and it does not block access to the municipal parking lot. It's wide enough there. Mm -hmm. You'd be able to charge vehicles and do deliveries at the same time. Yeah, that's the there way. Maybe yeah. Like yeah. Um, well, let me just mention one other thing is I've asked them to actually redraw this. And so the easement part where the electrical tap had is accurate the way I think it's going to stay. The actual configuration of those four EV charging bays, imagine that blue boxes would be rotated 180 degrees. And that's the other thing that I'd like to get the town's input on and make sure that's approvable. But in other words, you can see that there's very little usable safe space between the EV charging and the their covered deck that's been approved. Mm -hmm. um, so you're saying, Jerry, that stations charging units would be here and you'd pull in from this side. It'd be in so the same flip footprint the, that they have, but the access to it would be flipped. Right. So, so the yeah. guardrail would either go away or it would be parallel and close to the covered deck. Uh, uh, right, uh, yeah. Yeah. Take this. Sense. So the impact to the is is that the access to drive into them would be through the much wider and more frequently traveled mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Part, mm -hmm. uh, driveway to the municipal lot and to our delivery bay. So so you're saying that the, the, the truck that just happened to get you know photographed when this image was taken, that it's it it went it was going to that delivery bay, but that in the future trucks would have to get to that delivery bay from a from a different Right, right now they're not really using that one. I don't think they're they're using um, 
close to the where the green belt, the green guardrail line is. So they come in on the municipal driveway and then they angle in a little bit to get to so the very corner of the big that. building. I see. So that's how you would expect that's how you're expecting that they'll get to live yeah, once this is that's how place. Stephanie was getting pottery or play deliveries. Oh, okay. And that's how Kathy Bacon got freedom food deliveries. So neither one of these pictures shows accurately the lineup of the charging days. Um, not the way I hope it gets redrawn, but they haven't given it to us in time for this meeting. That was just a suggestion they're working on now. And, but again, it doesn't change the footprint. It, change, it just changes where the cars are going to enter. Exactly. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's all it changes. And makes it, I think, safer and more manageable for men. For no, the, that seems like a good change to me. For the pedestrians who go to that covered yeah. path. To flip it, yeah. yeah. You said that the, that the propane tanks are underground, but it's sort of, in this picture it almost looks like there are two propane tanks right there. Or is that, is yes, that, at that time there were. At that time there that, was. That, that's been cleaned up. There are still propane tanks next to the cafe building. Oh, okay. Um, so, so this picture is old enough that it's that the propane. Yeah, we've we've consolidated that, a whole bunch of tanks that are now underground oh, uh, around oh, the big building. Okay. Okay. This is a fairly confined area. Has it been surveyed? So we... Well, no, yeah, it hasn't been surveyed recently, as far as I know. But um, there's other drawings that have been done that are based on an old survey map. Like yourself. You're welcome to see if you want. But, but, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm a little surprised that these professionals drawing up the plans chose this to base it on rather than a survey. I didn't have any control over that, but to me it makes it a drawing that's hard to visualize. But <laughs> so, I, I think they're trying to keep these projects under budget just to remind you, this is, I think, VW um, legal funds that have been allocated and um, it's, it's part of a state grant. And so they have to be within a budget of what they're going to get for each of these. They're, they're heavily subsidized or completely subsidized, I guess. And who will do the cleanup you know, like for snow plowing and shoveling and something? Well, that's um, that's not clear from the contract yet. Um, I think it's going to fall on us, or it may be a combination of the town and us, us being Trillium. Um, right now, we're plowing the gravel parking lot there if we choose to, but we often don't in the wintertime because we don't really need it. It's a waste of expense. This would be a game changer where we'd have to keep it clear and um, I it's, it's not specifically in there because most of their contracts seem to be not in snowbound areas mm -hmm. but, but um, I think the default is that Trillium is going to have to clear it but it's as you can see it, it's right next to the town municipal lot and the town plows often now go sweep right through where there is going to be EV charging stations. So, so and, they, and then they take this big sweep and take it all to the back, off to the right. The other question or comment I would have was if you have dedicated spots over near the condo buildings, that's going to push them into the parking lot. Mm -hmm. Less parking. Yeah, we've pretty much eliminated any designated spots there. Um, there's some staff who use it intermittently. There's no lines. It's all very informal and as needed. It's nice as overflow occasionally, but what you see that looks like lined up. Not the reality currently. Is that 
on the map here. Yeah. But in terms of the number of cars that can park over there, whether they're designated. You're talking about on the Trillium property or in the municipal lot? Well, it seems to me like on the Trillium property, if you designate four spots there, that's going to push people who might park there into the public parking. Um, yeah, it, that is. Yeah, we've been discouraging people from parking there anyway because it's, it's, they can't figure out how to park and not impede the occasional deliveries. So, so, it's, so it's been, there's a lot of Merchants Row and Main Street businesses that have been parking there historically. So, so yes, I think it could. Increase the innovation of the municipal lot a little bit. But in the last year, there really has not been much use by the public of that. Is this been reviewed by the board of the press? No. Um, board of Adjustment. I mean, DRB? Yeah. Oh, okay. No. Um, yeah, I don't know if Mark thinks it needs to be. But, um. uh, yeah, I, I'm ha I can't really hear the board's questions. I'm sorry. There you go. I just turned the elevator off with my mind. Can you, you hear better now? Yeah. So um, Pat's question was whether or not it has to go to the DRB. Doesn't parking, traffic circulation, and so forth have to be approved? would have to look deeper into it. I mean, the, the essence of tonight, like uh, like Trevor mentioned, was if if in the fullness of the due diligence of the project, uh, we can make all of the various rules and regulations, including going before the DRB, if the, in order to try to figure all this out, all the, the moving parts, if, if the easement is something that can be granted it makes more sense for everybody to continue going down the, the path to make sure that we can get this done. So I I don't think I don't think uh, going before the DRB is going to an issue be an issue. I think the primary at this point the primary issue is going to be whether or not the town is willing to issue the easement for for the battery pack uh, for the electric boxes. Uh, once if the town is willing to do that, then everyone is very willing to sit at the table to make sure that all other aspects of the deal can be done. Okay. So this wouldn't require a specific motion, right? We're, we're really just asking questions and saying, yeah, this looks all right. And yep. So any other questions? Uh, we're being asked to, to authorize creation of an agreement, but it doesn't sound like that. Um, demands a motion so yeah it's just direction if you're okay with it we'll create the agreement and you'll take action presumably in december if everything is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you get a little more specific about who is going to make that agreement who's going to write it All right. I, I think we could as a good sort of faith participatory gesture see if we can take that on um, especially if we're going to view it as an agreement for use of pre-existing easement area. So then it might be a, a simplified version as has been suggested. So we, we may incur some legal costs, but we're not talking about anything crazy. Okay. Just to make sure. That and and you know, I don't know whether the DR, whether the agreement specifically refers to whether the DRB needs to get involved with this, but I would prefer to see us streamlining the process as much as we can um, um it, it it just it on the face of it it seems like a no-brainer to me and i i don't want to see us get it any more bogged down in bureaucracy than we need to so having um, the town attorney work work on this that's, that's just yeah. something you can direct you don't need board approval for right that. yeah what we might do is put together the outline get some feedback amongst the parties 
on the outset and make sure we're in the right spot and then have the town attorney do sort of that last pass through to make sure that we're not missing anything that the language is what it needs to be if there's something related to maintenance and liability or something like that okay. um, so that what you get is hopefully a, a finished mm -hmm. part that everybody's okay with would be the idea mm -hmm. okay. great ideal goal being approval or not at the next December meeting yeah Sounds like a good plan to me. Mm -hmm. okay. Can I just follow up on a question? Yeah, of course, Pat. Um, what you need from us is what you think you may need from us one or two areas by the building, right? Those need the electric pad, four by 12. That's something you need. So we get an easement here, and is that where you're saying? But that's that? already an easement. This is the spot that this is just a label that goes to that. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it would be this size. So there's already an easement here. There's already a, a larger easement over there. So they're in a different place. It's actually would, would be contiguous. Yes, they'd be essentially connected. Probably remove some of the bollards and add some different ones. So functionally, it'd be one big easement, bigger easement. Can you get that? Yeah, I think it's going to be important to have a good map. If this all agreements makes sense. Sure. All right. Well, if there's no other further questions or comments, we'll we'll move on. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. I'm sorry to catch your name again. You're, you're here. Are you here? What are you here for? No, you're here for something else. Huh? Is there somebody? Well, there's somebody else. He's just here for the excitement. For the excitement. Yeah. <laughs> okay, tonight. Right. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Mark. So, move on to traffic ordinance revisions update. Yep, we've put this out for review with. Um, the folks at Orange County Sheriff's Department, there are a handful of changes by and large. The older version, the, the original revised version was okay. Um, what is in here are actually additions to that with one clarification. So in the report we called out, there are four spots that are different between versions one and two. First one's purely a cleanup one. We took references to, to village streets and replaced them with police district streets, just so that way we've got formal entities with delineated boundaries that then match our contract space too. Um, so there's a couple of, of references to that. One that was added um, more or less by request of the library was to create, basically the language would create the ability for the board to designate as many as three spaces for the library to say during open hours, we put signage up and say, you know, limited to patron parking 30 minutes, Monday through Friday during these hours. And some of this is in response to one of the common points of feedback they get from patrons is it's harder to, to find some of those spaces available nearer to the library they're being used for right now Randolph House residents who are parking up above rather than in town lots or if their lots closed. That's a common, um, I don't call it a conflict point, they're just in the spaces and, mm -hmm. and, and keeping them, you know, keeping library patients from. So we'd be able to do three, we wouldn't have to do three, we sort of try to write it for flexibility. We could even try it, you know, as a smaller pilot project and see how it goes there. Um, we've also tried to be very clear that the, the enforcement level of enforcement, the mechanisms available should be you know, <laughs> dialed down. If somebody's there losing a library patron, probably not going to roll the cars for that. Um, but hopefully as a deterrent and as a, as a, um, neighborly thing to do it will have an impact the other two that are new the other two sections um one is about adding stop references to stop signs yield signs even if you don't really have many of those um hmm. they fall under it's a little bit easier to enforce if somebody goes through a rolling stop one of the things that when we were talking with the folks at orange county was we've got a little section in there on high priority at intersections it's just to call them out a little bit that they might get a little extra attention you know the four-way where Main Street, Central, and Park come together. Some of those hot spots, um, we're going to make sure people are being safe. Um, 
and traveling through those appropriately. And then the other one ties into some of the tractor trailer travel prohibitions. Right now what's listed in there were Highland and in Maple as two of the ones that have come up that the board has tried to take other action. Some of the feedback is that it's easier for the enforcement agencies if they find a truck where it shouldn't be um, to, to sort of take the appropriate actions, levy the appropriate fines and all that. Right now, Orange County, when they do do that, it's really more of um, an educational deterrence mechanism to your law enforcement entity to really zap a truck that's where it shouldn't be. Uh, you got to have an officer who's trained in that particular part <coughs> of enforcement as a set of truck scales. Um, just sort of paying it in into the weights so it might be dmv at some point comes in does a stint down there if we have issues that are ongoing um, and then the ordinance that was sort of the feedback is having it in our traffic ordinance provides that a, a additional um, enforcement capability for some of these entities to do that and it ties into whatever the applicable state and or other fines would be and that's separate from the overweight permits that are issued as part of a regular kind of statutory process for that. So those are the, the main changes. Everything else is pretty similar from the version we looked at. You can't remember if it was September. I think it was September. Um, and so one of the things we've been holding off on, making sure that as our primary enforcement entity, that they had a chance to review that. Um, we got any other pieces to incorporate. And so if you're okay with any of this, um, the next action step would be to warn that public hearing to move forward with some of these pieces. And I can review any of the other ones that you looked at before if you want. But. I just have more interesting questions about more specificity, specificity about the stop and, and yield language with that. Um, but that's what that's what the intent is for that and what, what that's going to accomplish what that's going to accomplish and yeah and I, I guess i'm not familiar with the high priority intersections of, is it, that's just that's just so I mean, it, like what what does that does right. it have any like real effect or it, it's more of a, a signaling policy intent rather than creating additional fines or other things. One of the things that, that will happen um, or that we've seen happen and there's some experience case law on is that if you don't have a stop sign that's been properly erected and is maybe not reflected in an ordinance as this is a stop. It's a little, um, I'll use an example from a town where if you go to Wadesfield, there are stop signs at either end of the covered bridge right in the middle of town. <clears throat> Until those got put into the ordinance, somebody was able to essentially roll through that, could have been caught by a sheriff, issued the ticket and contested it. and the motorist was usually successful in that because there wasn't anything that formalized those stop signs as traffic control points. So this language tries to very broadly introduce them all. What you see in some other municipal ordinances is a listing of every stop sign in the intersection. We could do that either in the ordinance or as an attachment um, and, and be more specific with it. Um, but the idea is that this language is, should be sufficient that right. for any existing stop or yield signs that we can basically right. enforce enforce that people actually stop or yield at them. That's the idea. And then if we had to say we were challenged, it still wasn't specific enough, then we could go to that next level and add and you know the listing of like yeah. but we don't if we don't have to go there that enough. It would be nice to yeah. Yeah, I can um, see why that would be nice. Yeah. Right. And to create that comment. So the high priority really is more of a policy statement that we talked about. There isn't sort of an additional fine structure for or anything. So do you need a do you need a motion to move ahead with these changes? I think if you would make one to warn a public hearing for the next opportune time, I think we've got enough time from a timeline perspective to do that um, for an ordinance change. So we're in for December. We've got to have everything warned 15 days out, and I'll have to look at a calendar. But if not, we could do it in January. Um, so you're, you're implying that we could we could warn it for our next. Regularly scheduled meeting. I think that would be the goal. Um, I'm just thinking ahead to the weekly newspaper holiday combination. I think sitting pretty pretty well within that 15 day window potentially. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we'll we'll aim for December. Um, so it might be that the motion is to warrant public hearing for December, and if the timelines don't allow, to post it in January. So moved. 
All in favor? Aye. 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 Next thing on our agenda is to uh, look at some community appointments. You've got one in the packet, Courtney Gately to the Conservation Commission. You've got the one Sonny brought to you, Matthew Johnson for the Planning Commission. And we had somebody who's been interested, has attended um, budget committee meetings. We didn't get any formal um, application materials from them at any point, um, but Jerry knows them, spoken with them. And so if you want to consider that, or if you want to wait and get something more formal, we can move that one to December. But that was another one that was originally in that mix when we scheduled put this on the agenda. So there's at least the one in the packet, the one that came to you today, and then that other one you could possibly consider. Um, in the case of the Conservation Commission, the Budget Committee, there's one seat to fill. Budget Committee would be for the remainder of, um, essentially, until the next election. Um, and then the individual will be reelected from, we usually do those from the floor, right? So, um, yeah. I don't see any of them here tonight, but Sonny and Jerry are both here for, be able to speak to other candidates. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to tell us a little bit about this? Um, yeah, I've known, Ben Barati, B A R A D I is his name. He, I met him a year and a half ago, shortly after he moved here. Um, he lives in town in the village, and he is not a lawyer, but he's a professor at the law school, and he teaches um, business and finance courses with an emphasis on law. So, so he's not. An economist or a rigorous statistician. He's definitely not an accountant. He's more of a academic business law um, expertise. Um, he has shown up at a meeting. He's been talking about being interested to me consistently for three or four months. Um, um, so. I think he's been genuine and is showing follow through, except for the fact that we asked him for to put something in writing and he didn't do it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so um, maybe we weren't clear. I don't know. But, so I I think you can accept him as um, genuinely interested and certainly qualified. Yeah, um, sounds like it. Yeah. I think he's the kind of guy who would have a CV that would dazzle you, but I haven't seen it. <laughs> well, well I, I don't have any problem with it. Uh, yeah, with, and it would just be an appointment until March. Is especially first. since it's temporary. And it's, yeah. Yeah. I was going to say it's about as low risk as you can get in terms of. Yeah. 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 And at the same time, it, it, I, mean, I hate to discourage people who want to volunteer for any of our. <laughs> right. committees, especially folks who seem like they, they could really be yeah. wonderful. So, yeah. um, well, that would need a formal motion from you guys. Yes. Yeah. Other other comments or questions from the board about any of these people? You're all willing to serve, and no one else is seeing in the pool. So you know, no, yeah. So seeing no other other uh, comments, uh, entertain a motion to approve all three people to their respective committees. I will make the motion to approve all three people to the respective committees uh, that they've expressed interest in. Oh, I'll second it. Although I'm a little concerned that we should be consistent in whether we require somebody to apply for something or not. I think that's been the general, like, I would, that's just been the general practice, but I don't think it's, a, it's like an official policy. Um, and usually people will, will, will choose to do that, we encourage people to do that, but I don't think yeah. it's a specific requirement. I think in the past we've said, okay, well, I'm doing an application and then look at it.
it's nice for sure. Uh, but I can, anyway, you have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Delinquent tax collector. This is Trevor's favorite part of the meeting. <laughs> is there any kind of application? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I get another job. Um, we've had the finance director serve in this role for a number of, of years, um, but having largely been without one for about a year now, um, we haven't moved with, um, and we're at the point now where this vacancy is going to extend out. We're not quite sure how long it would be, but we do need to move into um, whether it be charging penalties and interest on delinquent taxpayers, water and sewer payers, um, creating the payment agreements that we allow people to, to strike. Um, we need somebody who is the formally named delinquent tax collector. So the idea would be that I would assume the mantle and be the signatory on things and help wherever, but it would be that it would be me Kayla, who's our new employee in finance, and Cynthia from Nemrick, who's going to be with us for a while, too. And Cynthia's a former delinquent tax collector down in, what if she did in Westminster, Putney, or both, but um, we've become, um, you know, a, a single entity where a lot of the front end stuff, identification of who's delinquent, what the amounts would be, you know, doing a lot of the back of the house functions and where I might come in is to just review, say, a payment agreement and be the one to actually sign off on it. Um, it lets us get those functions moving again and then keep them moving forward. And then we would probably not be as um, prone to use the tax sale mechanism for non-payment as we have in the, in the past, just because of the same kind of resource constraint. But we might at some point say if we Happen to find ourselves in late spring and need to, um, or want to for whatever reason. We, we certainly that's part of the process that comes with it too. And then the town attorneys get involved in that and do a lot of the actual, um, you know, handle a lot of the the technical mechanical details for us. So because you've moved to appoint this in the past, um, that's it. If this were still an elect, elected delinquent tax collector, I wouldn't be able to hold the role. I can't hold elected office um, as a town manager. So it's because of the decision to appoint. That's how we avoid being incompatible for this. We don't have any other options in house, um, frankly. So okay. if we if we did, I'd go for it. But yeah, I'm sure you would. <laughs> I'm hoping we appoint the town manager as as a monthly. Tom, did you hear the motion? Uh, I'll, I'll make that motion. Pat, Pat made the motion. I, I think. Oh, Pat, uh, I'll second. I'm sorry. I, I, okay. I didn't hear Pat. Uh, yeah, all right. I, I thought you might not have heard him. Yeah, yeah, I did not. All in favor? Aye. 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 Passes. Uh, request for engineering services. Yeah, this is just, we're seeking authorization. We've got four different RFPs that would um, that would fall under this single topic. It's um, the engineering services RFP, part of it's, it's part budget exercise, part um, backup plan. If you go back a couple of months, we've talked about um, whether or not to add capacity similar to what we had when Marty Sanchez was here, where there was an engineer and zoning person combined into one. Um, one of the areas of concern is that's such a specific, unique combination of skill sets and experiences um, that we can try to go for that. Um, we might have better luck or better shape considering something a little broader, such as a planning and zoning administrator or a zoning and grants administrator is one idea that would be, would be pretty helpful. And um, we can go and get those engineering services that we're missing through an engineering services agreement. So it's budget time at a minimum to be able to see what the costs would be um, for that. So this is a, an individual or a firm. I've worked with both in this capacity that would be able to handle, you know, it'd be RFP drafting. It would be estimating project scoping up to a certain point would provide us, you know, if there was development review that we needed, um, we're going to take over the street at um, Salisbury Square once it's built, for example, that's something that they would provide would be that. Um, 
certification compliance service. So we'd be going out trying to get that um, and figure out what the cost would be so we could build it into the budget. And we could always sort of create a scope of work that fits a budgeted number. That's a good time to do that. The other one is we've talked about before, but not for a while. We also need some engineering services. There's so much infrastructure and other money floating around. We have project ideas, but not even numbers to go and pursue some of these things over the next couple of years. So the idea would be to put an RFP out for that and try to pick, I don't know if it makes sense to try to do four projects, six that would then at least receive some sort of initial scoping. So we know estimate, have some sort of reasonable project budget that will be close and then we can go seek the different awards. And so I listed some of the ones in there. Um, so there might be one that we try to leave as broad as possible, um, but we may also be specific. So some of the ones that have come up that we don't have numbers for, then something like Beanville water sewer extensions. If we can change engineer and change the intersection of Beanville and, and the Route 12 south, we can better enable the truck traffic to just go that way and come in and out from that end of things as opposed to trying to navigate Pleasant Street. Um, Central Street bridges come up, Stockholm slope stabilization, missing network pieces. Some of this, if we do an engineering service agreement, it might fit in there, like the, the sidewalk network pieces, might be able to kind of double up on that. So the idea is to try to put something together that would let us go identify some projects and go out and be competitive for some of the infrastructure money. Um, and it may be that that's a sort of an early use of ARPA funds, and I think it's going to be terribly expensive, but it enables us really to go forward because without it, um, I'm guessing. Um, and uh, that's uh, not where we want to be. So, like you said, this would be work that if we had a town engineer that they would do. Yeah. Um, if with this, mm -hmm. we've opened the possibility of, of if we did find somebody mm -hmm. that we could hire someone yeah. um, and, and not, we, like we wouldn't have to, we wouldn't be committing to using these services if we were able to. Right, what we may do is, is um, get a sense of cost and scale and availability. And then as we build a budget, we'll know whether we're gonna to try to find the former model and put that in there. But if for some reason we weren't able to fill it, it delays sort of when we would kick in what that would be. And we'd almost be sort of budgeting both, both pieces in that model. To, to have that surety, um, but you wouldn't have to spend it if you find found somebody to do the other piece. I think given the timing of everything, it, it makes some sense just to, even if we just did the, a one or two year deal, to have that extra service. I, I think the final Marty is gonna be, I think we're unicorn hunting a little bit. That was specific to the individual and the circumstance. Yeah. I actually know somebody who has expressed some interest. Oh, really? <laughs> who could actually- If we have a unicorn, we go- could actually- yeah. <laughs> do this, um, but I but it's all right. So I'm just one. So that, that's anyway. So yeah, I mean, that, not that it's a, a distinct you know, like a certainty or anything. It's yeah. some it's some it's like what is possible, right? The other two RFPs we need to do um, to go out higher appraiser. This is part of the 15 Lincoln Avenue buyout. This is required under the terms of the grant, so to come up with a value. Um, for the property is part of that. So this would be an RFP to go out and find that appraiser to be able to do that. So we keep that process moving forward. And then the um, final one that's in there is, what do I do with it? Um, mowing services again for Randolph Center and East Randolph. Like, we're fairly sure we're not gonna be able to find anybody or to somebody's to sort of fill those positions, provide that frontline service. It worked really well. This would be a two-year contract to have the mowing, trimming, grounds maintenance services. If we do it now, we can incorporate it into the budget rather than trying to figure out how to make it fit out of emergency need. So the timing is kind of right. That one's already written up and revised and ready to go if it's authorized. So we can incorporate it into the budget. We're not getting rid of those frontline positions. We're just sort of recognizing that at 14.56 an hour. Um, we're probably not going to be able to fill them. Um, and we can't sort of stretch it. It was nice to have the contract this summer because even with a smaller um, employee pool on the town end and then having the graves dug by Judah Funeral Homes, for example, Harold and his crew were able to <coughs> dig in town properties, town structures in ways that they hadn't been for a while. Um, so we really did see, I think, some benefit on 
the coordination and, and completion of task end of things. Um, it makes some sense from there. So, so those are the four RFPs we'd be going out to get. There's nothing if you don't sign a contract or award it, we're not obligating any money to go out the door. Um, most of them would come through either the budget or grant funds. It might be that the project scoping is one that we have to identify funding and, and it was way back to when we talked about it a couple of times, ARPA money had been highlighted a little bit as sort of an investment. And the timing might even fit together okay for it to go through, go through the regular process, but until we know the cost, it's hard to say what we need. Would um, somebody who applied for this be in a retainer? Or... Yeah, we'd sign, so an engineering service agreement, we might say there's a two year thing, we'd authorize kind of a maximum amount. We might have set tasks that are laid out, you know, sort of annual basis. So I think having a, them help us with the um, paving RFPs, contract language, all that stuff on the back end. Um, you know, the contract language, that would be one that we build in every year. It might be that we've got specific projects we want them to work on, grants to review, things that we've called out, and anything above that would be kind of demand response specific up to that maximum with some ability to step outside of it if we, you know, on mutual agreement and move board motion or something. Because um, the way, the last one I did, we structured it where it was essentially, here's the amount for the year, we'll use it in any way we want, but if we, we're still only kind of charged up to that maximum for services rendered. So if we don't have anything going on. So the intent would be to establish a uh, price. Yep, yeah, <clears throat> price and get a sense of providers. And it's a kind of a way to, to back in, <coughs> excuse me, the services we need. That, that's one of the big areas of, as we try to rebuild capital plans, we try to get through projects that are underway, as we try to plan for future project, that's, that's an Achilles heel. It's, we don't have an engineer by trade. It's, this is all sort of sleight of hand that we've all picked up along the way. Um, I'd like to move that we uh, we bundle this quartet of uh, request proposals and, and authorize the staff to proceed with them. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Passes. Do you have any other business? Not that I have for you, no. Okay. And you want some manager's report. Nothing new beyond what's written there. As you may have heard, we're paving. There's been some disruption <laughs> in travel, but we are, are near the end. Um, and, and that'll be good to do. Grading gone out, they've done all of that. So as of sort of the end of the paving project, every mile that we maintain should be in a pretty good spot. Um, staffing, we've got, um, we're in the external, oh, sorry. Before you move on from paving, um, I've noticed some, that the paving the, in certain places seems to be not maybe as professional as I've seen other paving in the past mm -hmm. and wondering what, like, what do we do about that? You know, like, like center seams in a lot of spots mm -hmm. were not flat. I don't know. How, I don't know whether that's a, a significant issue or not. I mean, off the top of my head, it seems like, right. like, like it shouldn't be that way. Like, it should have. Yeah. Like, well, anyway, I mean, anyway, that's just one example. I've seen, right. I've seen, and heard about some other, you know, issues where maybe the painting didn't kind of go as well as as we might expect it to. So yeah. what, what, do we, what do we do with, with that sort of thing? Well, we had the contractor, someone sort of up in the food chain come out, they met with John, they walked some of these areas of concern because we've been raising them for a little bit and came up with a plan to, to remediate those, um, to fix those or to shore them up or to add pavement in some areas where maybe it looks a little, a little shabbier than it should or a little thinner than it, than it should. Um, and then with the seams, I, uh, that's when I'll have to check to see what the prescription is there. We've been focused more on sort of risers, storm drains, driveway transitions. Those are the ones that have come up more often, but it does look in some spots where you, the seam is noticeable, uh, more noticeable than 
than I can recall. Yeah, I mean, scene, usually but I don't, you can, I don't you know can, if that. Usually you can see the scene, but right. it's but like it's but it's smooth, right. even though you can see it. But so in these cases, sometimes it's like yeah. So they went and into yeah. The, yeah. Work. And then at the end of the day, if the work doesn't meet the specifications or the expectations, we essentially say that we're not. Right. There's an acceptance process that we'll go through at yeah. the end. If we're not accepting the work, then mm -hmm. we can pursue other remediation efforts from there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Probably, yeah, you're right, Gary. Larry, seeing the seam and actually feeling it when you're traveling over it is kind of two different things. So. And then have, 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 have you guys noted spaces where like um, where the where the pavement seems really rough, like where the there's the aggregate but not the the stuff that's the supposed binder. to fill it, the binder between yeah. them is missing. Yeah, there, and there's some areas that we um, you know where they might add more material um, closer to the railroad tracks, for example. There's some areas where it was maybe a little thin, and then some um, sidelines a little bit. Some areas where um, out whether or not they milled really around like i said around the risers and stuff like that so mm -hmm. um, an inch and a half so it's going to feel thin in spots too in the places that were just a shim and overlay so you know maple earl but, uh, but they've been out they've done the walk through identified the areas of need there was a plan to address those um so then we'll be able to check against the original specs it's the sort of the plan to address and then at the end of the day we have non-acceptance basically all their parts really would could be how we structured. So if we're happy with one section, we could sort of hone in on on an area. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it didn't seem like this was so much a matter of how thick it was. It was just you know, that top quarter or half inch where you can actually yeah. see like sections where it's visibly missing. You know, part of that what should be a nice smooth surface when they're done is is much rougher. Than you, would, than you would expect. And you can actually you can just see it you know, as you walk by. It's pretty, pretty apparent. We've noticed in other areas, um, not here in town, but on newer paper, there's almost like an undulation or a, a little bit of a, a bounce effect in certain areas, um, just in terms of how the pavement was compacted or not. And, uh, I don't know if there's a materials change or issue or something like that, but, but yeah, we do. We are going to go back through, try to address everything that's been highlighted. Maybe things that we missed or don't hit that we'll have to address in other ways. But um, you know, I think um, based on the written report, that's sort of it. We'll do the Branchwood update in December. It looks like. Um, that project has stalled out for lack of funds that T Work was getting, I think, from the state for this in particular, and they're seeking some other funds. Um, so, we're kind of in the second phase of the site assessment there for the environmental pieces. Um, and then, like I said, with the staffing, we're focusing right now on those um, front end exterior positions, so the ones in highway buildings and grounds and recreation facilities. We've got candidates for all of them in some form. So if we're able to hire into those spaces, um, that gets us pretty close, if not to full, if not full, kind of there. And we'd be down to really just the finance director's role, um, which is we are out in, a, in common areas for that and advertising and paid for the featured ads and we've had zero applications. Mm -hmm. and wow. Then, our players going through this now, they've seen a small pool with candidates that are um, maybe not as fully qualified as they would hope, and that's a job that would normally draw a little bit better. Um, and there are others that are seeking it. So we're also in a more competitive space for fewer candidates. So it, it, it'll be interesting to see what the process entails. Um, but that's a big one to, to both get right, and it would be nice to fill it, I think, because we're not totally bereft of staff in, in there anymore. Um, Michaela, who's been sending you the AP and the payroll emails, is really grabbing onto those pieces, doing quite well. Cynthia certainly knows, you know, as a, as a veteran of this. So we've stabilized a little bit from where we were, say, in late July, early August, when there was nobody in there. Um, so. so once we get a finance director, that department will be fully functional. Yeah, yeah. 
That's right. But I would I would count on this almost like a, it's been a siege. And it will continue. We're probably getting through town meeting before anybody's really in the role. If we're lucky, we can find somebody to hire them on. I mean, I'm, I'll still probably handle the budget, capital budgeting stuff all the way through. At this point, it doesn't you know, yeah. well to bring somebody else on. Mm -hmm. and that's kind of a big, a big task. Um, but that's what we had to do last year to get through. Um, we're trying to prep for the audit. Cliff did us a real solid a year before because everything was lined up before he left. But for this, we're trying to collect those pieces. Um, you know, from the list. But that's that's a real big, if you ask me for a pressure point, at least on, on me, in terms of the vacancies, that's yeah. the one. Sure, sure. Because it's hands on pick it up, plus it's that's an important relationship for your organization. I'm getting better at Nemrex. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's all I got for it. Okay. Any other questions for Trevor? All right. Executive session is next on our agenda then. So you got this is a two motion one. Um, the finding would come first, and then the motion to enter. And then on the motion to enter, Jim Carroll has jumped on with us. So just going to make sure that when we do the motion to enter, that we invite Jim to join us. So the first motion would be the finding that executive executive session is necessary and prudent. And premature general public knowledge would place the town at a disadvantage. I will make that motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Motion passes. And then I will move that we consider uh, a motion to enter into executive session pursuant to uh, the appropriate state statutes relative to contracts, personnel appointment, or evaluation of a public official and legal. And are you going to invite to invite us? Jim Carroll to join us? And to invite Jim Carroll to join us. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Passes. I, you won't have any motion coming back out, so it's like we've done before. I don't think you'll have any motion coming back out. So okay. So, so yeah. So usually we. Did everyone adieu at this point? Yeah, so we're done with the public part of the meeting. Thank you very much.